proceeded with his PhD in economics at London School of Economics. Uh, after his first teaching position at the University of Rochester, Dr. Shepard joined Santa Clara University, located in the heart of Silicon Valley in, in California. Uh, Dr. Shepherd, in short, is an expert on why people behave as they do. Uh, his writing spearheaded the development of two uh, distinct subfields, uh, behavioral economics and behavioral finance, uh, which blend economics, finance, mathematics, and, and psychology. Um, over the past four decades, um, Dr. Shefflin has been a pioneer in this area with research into self-control issues, I'm sure we all have them, <laughs> ethics and risk <laughs> management, and succeeded where many scholars don't, uh, effortlessly translating this big data into practical advice for academics, professionals, and the public. Dr. Shefferin's research articles have been published in many economics and finance uh, journals, in particular Journal of Finance, Journal of Financial Economics, Journal of Financial and Quantitative Analysis, uh, to name a few. Uh, Dr. Shefferin is also uh, a regular contributor to Forbes and has published in the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. And Dr. Shefflin uh, is here today to talk about climate change, uh, possibly one of the biggest challenges facing our society. And his talk will focus on key themes associated with climate change. So please help me welcome today's speaker, Dr. Hirsch. Well, thank you very much, Christina, for your kind introduction. And I have to say it's uh, really a pleasure and a delight to be back in my hometown, my, my university where I earned my undergraduate degree. Um, I want to welcome you all. I also want to welcome a group at the University of Alberta studying behavioral corporate finance that I normally speak to privately, but this, uh, this year will the University of Manitoba and the University of Alberta will, will, will combine for, for today's event. Um, it's really, uh, this topic of climate change, as Christina said, I think is one of the most urgent challenges faced by the human race. And I've decided for, I have one chance left to sort of pivot academically, and so I decided that what would make the most sense would be to pivot into something that uh, was profoundly important, and I think that climate change fits that ca characterization to the bill. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, a series of distinct dimensions of climate change, all of which relate to my time here at the U of M. I, I do want to say that as a student, I was profoundly interested in environmental issues here at the U of M. I became very sensitive to those, to those issues, and I've thought about those issues my, 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 whole, my whole life. I started out in honors physics, and then I pivoted into mathematics and, and economics, and all of those features, the physics, the economics, the mathematics, they all play an important role in terms of understanding the various facets of climate change. So I'm going to go through a one-hour uh, whirlwind tour of some of the highlights associated with the issue. And interspersed throughout will be comments about the underlying psychology that impacts the way that we make judgments about climate change and the way we make decisions about how we face climate change. So with that, can you sort of forgive me for stepping behind the podium just to be able to change slides and I'll, I'll just uh, go ahead and continue. So I'm, I've divided the talk into three parts. First, I'll talk about the science. And then I'll talk about the business and economic uh, dimension of climate change. And I'll conclude by talking about politics and returning specifically to, to the important behavioral issues associated with the topic. Let me give you a quick overview of the science of climate change using, using the diagram that you see before you. So here we are uh, on planet Earth below and the sun provides us with solar energy. And the solar energy that, that comes in, not all of it gets through the atmosphere. Some of it is reflected back. 
by what's called the Earth's albedo. The Earth's albedo is about uh, 30%, which means that 70% of the, uh, of the energy from the sun makes its way through the atmosphere and makes it down to ground level. Once it's at ground level, it warms up the Earth's surface. And in the course of warming up the Earth's surface, we have radiation, infrared radiation, that heads back up. And that's the red arrow that you see. So the yellow is coming down from the sun, some of it reflecting back, some of it making to the Earth. The red in the center moves back up through the atmosphere. And over to the right, you see it being dispersed, some of it making its way back out through the atmosphere, and some of it staying within the atmosphere itself. The greenhouse effect is the effect of maintaining, not allowing all of that infrared, infra, infrared radiation to escape back out into space. And that's what enables our planet to be warmer than it would be otherwise. The average temperature of, of the Earth is about 14.5, 15 degrees Celsius. Were it not for there being a greenhouse effect, meaning that some of the radiation, because of uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, keeping some of that radiation locked in, the, the temperature of the Earth would be about minus 18. So the whole world, whole world, oh, I just managed to get rid of my, there we are. The whole world would be like a cold winter Winnipeg day, okay, <laughs> without the greenhouse effect. And instead, it's about, it's about 14 or 15. Now, what, because we are emitting more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere as a result of industrial activity, than has historically been the case, and I'm talking about history reaching back thousands and millions of years, uh, what's happening is that the greenhouse effect, which is a good thing, well, now we have too much of a good thing. So the Earth is heating up at a more rapid rate, and it, that more rapid rate has profound implications for, uh, for the way that life on the planet will, will continue. Um, 1981, an incredibly important paper, was published in Science. So the science of climate change, published in Science, whose author, lead author was James Hansen, who headed up the Goddard Institute at NASA, described the climatic implications of increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide. Um, this is the first page of his article, and he, talk, he described the greenhouse effect, which, remember, is generally a good thing. So global warming is too much of a good thing, but the greenhouse effect is a good thing. And so the science begins with what's called, in, among cli climate scientists, a zero-dimensional model. And in equilibrium, in physical equilibrium, the incoming energy from the sun is the same as the outgoing energy from the infrared radiation. And so the temperature stays constant when the inflow and the outflow are matched. If we do something to increase the amount of infrared radiation that is retained, we force the temperature to go up using this equation that you see red boxed at the bottom. It's just a bigger version of what's up on the right-hand side. And the, the, the temperatures, this is temperatures of Kelvin, okay, not Celsius, but Kelvin. So what we know is that basically this is what determines the temperature of the Earth. S sub zero is the amount of solar radiation that arrives from the sun before it's reflected back. It's not what makes it through. What makes it through is S zero times one minus A. A is the Earth's albedo, about 30%. And then you divide that by 4 over uh, sigma, which is the uh, Stefan Boltzmann constant, uh, raised to the power uh, 1 fourth. Uh, so, and then there's this other factor that's not in the equation called epsilon. That's the Earth's emissivity. It's the amount of radiation that basically makes it back out. And so if you do anything 
that increases the Earth's emissivity, you're going to wind up decreasing the temperature of, of the Earth. You do the reverse, you'll wind up raising the temperature. That's the basic equation that tells us what determines the, the Earth's temperature. At the end of this article, in 1981, appears a series of predictions. So that's the actual article up at the top. I've just pulled out some of the key highlights. And this is what Hansen told us in 1981, that if we don't do something to stabilize carbon emissions at the pre-industrial level of about 350, we're going to see, in short order, short order means within decades, drought in North America and Central Asia. We will see the beginning of the erosion of the West Antarctica ice sheet, and that's going to result in increased sea levels. And we're going to see the opening of the Northwest Passage, which was a center point of all the Canadian history that I studied about what it is that the French and the English were looking for when they settled North America. So Hansen, seven years after publishing this article, was invited by Congress to speak about climate change. And uh, what you see off to the right is the, is the cover of his congressional testimony. And one of the things that he said when asked about how certain he was that we really did have increasing temperatures, he said he was 99% confident. Okay? That is a very high statement of confidence. As a behavioral economist, I would say you, whenever anybody makes a long-term prediction with that degree of confidence, first thing to ask is, hmm, is that prediction reflective of overconfidence? Is it a psychological bias? So in my talk today, I basically will, my own position personally is I think that, that Hansen had it right, but nobody's perfect. And so I'm going to point out weaknesses in the arguments of all sides as I go through it, as I see them, uh, from the perspective of, of, of the behavioral approach. So in, in 88, um, Hansen published an article that was the basis of the testimony he gave before Congress. And uh, this is the uh, top, what you see is the title of the article, and then the most important graph in the article. And this is, this is what that graph showed. It showed in 88 what the Earth's temperature had been recently, starting in, 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 the, in the 1950s. And then it gave a series of three projected trajectories for what the Earth's temperature would do, depending on the human response to the threat. He called them scenarios A, B, and C. And that's what you see off to the right. You see A, a B, and C, three, three, three scenarios. A top one, a middle, and a bottom. And this is how he described them. He said the top one was on the high side. It would, it would bound what he thought would be the absolute worst thing we would see in terms of temperature rise. The C trajectory, the bottom one, is what would happen if we found a way to curtail and get to zero growth emissions by 2000, 12 years after he gave the testimony. And then B was what he thought was most plausible. Well, how do things look from the perspective of 2019? We can go look and see, because that was a very long, bold forecast. So the blue is our actual temperatures. The dashed line at the bottom is the null hypothesis that you would make to say, there is going to be no change. If you were an, a, a strong climate skeptic in 1988, the prediction you should make is that the Earth's temperature will not change at all. And so your prediction would be the dashed line at the bottom. So what you can see is that the blue is, coincides with the pink, which was the lower, the lower projection for a while, but then drifts up towards, towards the middle. Scenario B. So what you would conclude from this is that Hansen was a bit pessimistic at the bottom, 
because temperatures did not increase at quite the extent that he thought they would, but ultimately did move into, into the range of, of scenario B. So if there was a bias in the projection, the question is, why? And the answer is, well, there was a, 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 he made assumptions, just like economists make assumptions, about parameters. And the key parameter in, in Hansen's work was climate sensitivity. And by climate sensitivity, the, really quest, the question is, to what degree is temperature sensitive to carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere? If you double CO2 concentration, what, do you, what, a, what is the implication for delta T, for the change in the temperature? And Hansen assumed that was 4.2 degrees Celsius. And that turned out to be a bit too high. If you wanted to nail it, Hansen should have been at about 3.4 as sensitivity, not at, not at 4.2. But you know, both of those numbers are in the, in the range that the UN um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, has specified, which is 2 to 4.5 degrees Celsius. That's, that's the implication of what happens if we double CO2 concentration. We're going to get an increase of somewhere between 2 and 4.5. Uh, uh, temperature. Hansen was clear in saying, we're safe at 350. If we, could, if we could have found a way to stabilize at 350, which is about where we were in 1988, if you, can, if you follow the graph, and you can see all these 350s in the middle box, we could have rested easy. But you can see we broke through 350 at about that time. And the trajectory has been up like an arrow. And it's sort of easy to predict what CO2 levels are likely to be and how long it's going to take us to double CO2, given that the policies haven't changed, given that we haven't been fighting climate change, given that most of what we've done has been by way of rhetoric you know, more than, more than action. So I think Hansen is the most important climate scientist alive today. He has been since 1980, and I think that most of what he has to say has been clear okay, and straightforward. Um, he wrote a piece in 2012 with, with these two colleagues and here's what he told us in 2012. He said, look, if you look at a single event, like, for example, Hurricane Sandy that struck New York City, it's difficult to attach, to say that those specific events are because of climate change, because of global warming. The test is distributional. Just look at how frequently extreme events happen. And so the temperature distribution how often days of particular temperature happen each year, has been shifting to the right. And we're now getting more of what, in the old days, we would have called three sigma events. Events three standard deviations out from the mean. Except now they're not three sigma events with the new distribution, of course. It's the three sigma is relative to the original distribution. So that's what the three means. And so the test is, if this distribution continues to shift to the right, that is evidence in favor of what the theories predict. So remember Hansen's predictions from 1981. He told us the West Antarctica ice sheet would begin to erode. You just have to look at the New York Times. It's happening. It's leading to sea level change, just as he said. If you ask about the Northwest Passage, go look what's happening around Greenland. Look at Arctic ice sheets. Look at what's happening to polar bear populations. Look at what's happening to ice flows. Look at what's happening to Russia and Chinese claims on the north. That's going to pose severe implications, military and political implications, for what this country is going to be facing in the future. If you look at the issues of drought in the US, which he predicted, so if you go to Las Vegas, Las Vegas is fed by the Colorado River. 
Lake Mead, just below the Hoover Dam, is at 40% of what used to be its normal levels. It's declining. And if you look at Central Asia, it's the same thing. Every single prediction Hansen made in 81, 30 years, 35 years later, it's happening just the way he said it would. And you know, you can make predictions and be lucky. Predictions really difficult, especially about the future, as they say. It's, it's, it's hard to say all of those predictions, he was just lucky. Maybe he was lucky, and maybe he was lucky, but the odds are that it's the theory that's right. So that's, that's the science. So now we come to the business and the economics. I'll start with the business. Manitoba Hydro? Manitoba Hydro still provide power to the province? Okay. So the Northern California counterpart of Manitoba Hydro is Pacific Gas and Electric. So that's where I get my, the electricity and gas that goes to my home. It's supplied by PG&E. PG&E is the very first climate change bankrupt firm. Bankrupt because it's uh, uh, electric, electricity transmission equipment is responsible for sparking some of the major wildfires in the state. And those wildfires have been, we always have them every year, but, but in the last few years they are starting earlier, they are lasting longer, they're much more intense, and they move much more quickly than they ever have in the, in, in, in the history of California since it was populated by Europeans. It's just phenomenal. And PG&E, is legally liable for the damage, and the damage is huge. So huge that they can't meet, meet, meet those claims, which is why they've declared bankruptcy. And it's just the first situation. So climate risk is with us now in a very tangible way. It's no longer theoretical, it's tangible. Going forward, companies are going to have to adjust in a systematic ways. All companies will have to adjust in systematic ways to climate change. They won't have time to debate, is climate change happening or not? Is it anthropogenic or not? They're going to be too busy having to figure out how to deal with it. And so, in Europe, the Europeans are taking the lead, along with Michael Bloomberg, who is an American, former mayor of New York. This is Mark Carney. Mark Carney used to be governor of the Bank of Canada, now governor of the Bank of England, and also received an honorary doctorate from the University of Manitoba, I'm proud to say. So the two of them together are major leaders in your, on the European initiative for what will happen in respect to accounting for climate change in businesses. And it's going to be part of the way that public companies have to report. They will have to, it won't just be financial statements that they will be disclosing. They're going to have to dis disclose information about how they measure and deal with climate risk. And climate risk is huge. If, if you're a pharmaceutical firm and m your manufacturing is concentrated in Puerto Rico and Puerto Rico gets wiped out for three years because of major hurricane activity, you're going to be in trouble. And some, of, and some of the people who consume your products might die because they can't get needed drugs that only you've produced and you produce them only in Puerto Rico. Supply chain issues. Where you locate geographically is going to be important. It's, it's going to change a lot about the way all companies are going to have to think about what they do. So T. Rowe Price, a major financial services firm based in Baltimore, they're at serious risk. Why? 
because Baltimore is located in a hurricane-prone zone, and hurricanes are going to be much more intense. For all Winnipeggers who like to become snowbirds and go to the southern, west, southern part of Florida for the winter, well, that's going to be underwater in our lifetime. You know, the edge of Florida might be around Orlando. Miami may be gone. It's that serious in terms of sea level rise. So this is all going to be changing. The IPCC tells us we need to be thinking about adaptation and mitigation. Why? We're not getting concentration of CO2 down to 350. It's simply, we're just going to have to deal with it. Okay? So what does that mean? Well, it means let's, let's think about where the sources of energy are. Where do we consume fossil fuels now where we need replacement? Heating and cooling. Okay. So staying warm in Winnipeg in, in the winter and, 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 and having, it be, having Texas be bearable in the summer, that takes huge amounts of energy to do that. Transportation, okay. with automobiles especially, but also airplanes, and, and, and simply generating power. So those are opportunities to shift resources in order to mitigate the impacts of climate change. Agriculture. Agriculture is going to be a huge issue. What, things we have to worry about are that areas prone to dryness will become much drier, and areas that might be slightly prone to wetness are going to become much wetter as there are shifts because of climate change. That's going to that's have major implications for, 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 for food supply chains. It's going to have major implications for Western Canada. Flood control. Okay. In 1950, there was a major flood in this city, which I barely remember. I was born in 48. Barely remember. But my mom had to evacuate me. And we went out to Sault Ste. Marie. I spent part of my, my childhood in Sault Ste. Marie while waiting for the waters to subside in Winnipeg. That was before the floodway. Nebraska and Iowa, this year they've dealt with unprecedented losses because of floods. It's all changing, and we're going to have to shift resources to deal with it. Okay? It'll be too late just to sit around and complain and wring our hands. We're just going to have to deal with it. And businesses, the private sector, is going to be shifting in order to meet those challenges, you know, hopefully led. By, 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 uh, with gov good government guidance. So renewables. So there is investment underway. This gives you the trajectory from 2007 in global investment in renewable energies. And you can see it's gener generally been climbing up. And if you look at 2015, 16, and 17, the boxed area, what you'll see is that a major shift took place that North America had been the leader in renewable investments, but now it's the leaders, leadership has shifted over to Asia. So if you look at power and fuels by country, up at the, the red at the right, that's the US, and you can see their pattern of investment year after year that it's kind of been steady. But look at China to the right. Okay. Just look at that enormous growth in investment in renewable energy. They've taken the leadership position. And you think about Canada, so 17% of Canada's domestically generated total energy comes from renewable sources already, higher than the rest of the world, okay, which is about 13%. Canada generates 10% of the world's hydroelectric power, second only to China. And hydroelectric power is clean. Uh, if you look at where the investment is taking place, it's mostly in solar and wind. Okay. Yes, biopower, yes, biofuels, yes, geothermal, it's all there. But now the action is solar and, solar and wind. Manitoba. Okay. 
So this is from an article written over 10 years ago. How is Manitoba going to be impacted by climate change? Four categories. So first, the end of farming as we know it. What does the author of the article mean by that? He means we're going to have to change our crop portfolio in Western Canada because the nature of climate will change. He talks about northern exposure, that the people in the northern part of the province are going to face major upheaval. And no northern Canada, northern Canada is, is going to undergo impacts that we can only begin to imagine now. There is going, climate change is going to force mass migrations of people. It's possible and even likely that the whole southwestern part of the United States is going to dry up to the point where it won't be possible to live in Phoenix or Tucson or San Diego or Los Angeles. There won't be enough water. There are going to be mass migrations from other parts of the world to places that are nice. And that by me, northern Canada. This might be a terrific place that the world wants to get to because it's so well positioned. I can tell you, Vladimir Putin is very excited about climate change because Russia's in the same position. Okay. The Russians are taking steps to accentuate climate change because it's a good thing for them, not a bad thing. Lake Winnipeg in hot water. You don't have to wait for July to swim comfortably in Lake Winnipeg. That's what's going to happen. But it's going to change the eco environment of Lake Winnipeg. The fish population, aquamarine, aquamarine population, it's all going to, it's going to change. And cities are going to have to adapt to extreme weather because that's the thing about climate change. Um, it's, it's not just about everything warming up all at once. It's about it's about increasing sigma, the degree of variability across the globe. It's the extremes that are going to become the new normal. And so we have to have systems to deal with those extremes. So anybody who's not from Winnipeg is always amazed at the tunnel system and that, that allows you to sort of move around downtown during, during the winter. Okay. The, They'll have to learn from Winnipeg's example about how to deal with extreme weathers. Yeah. I'll always, people are always amazed when I, because when they think Winnipeg, if you're not from Winnipeg, and the first thing they think about Winnipeg are the harsh winters. And I say, yes, but it's hot in the summer. It's not, it's not, it's not cold in the summer. The extremes in Winnipeg are enormous. I remember my, my, my first trip to, to um, actually my first and only trip to Alaska, which happened to be in the winter. Uh, and you know the great thing, once Arna, my wife, and I got there was we said, oh my god, it's no colder than Winnipeg. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is Bill Nordstrom, I should say. This is Bill Nordstrom. Bill Nordstrom won the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, this year, this past uh, December. And he, I think, is probably the world's leading economist on, on climate change. And he put together, over the course of his, of his academic career, a model called the Integrated Assessment Model. And uh, there are two versions. There's a, uh, a one-world model called DICE, and then a, a regional model called RICE. And I've always been interested in environmental issues and climate change, but sort of in a, in a casual way. When I got serious about it, it was, I sat down and really worked through um, Bill's model. And that model takes traditional economic theory, I'm a theorist by training, and it takes climate science modeling and it puts them together. Because it's clear if, if climate change is anthropogenic, if it's caused by human activity, it's the global economy that's going to be changing it. We need to understand the way, we need a model that helps us understand 
the feedback loops between the environment and the economy. And that's what, that's what Bill gave us. He gave us this wonderful model. So that model provides us with a way, it's not perfect, but it provides us with a way to get our hands around the question, what is effective economic policy for dealing with climate change? And Bill's model told us decades ago that you need to tax carbon. You need to tax carbon. There's no way around it. There's nothing close as a second best alternative. There are alternatives, but nothing comes close to taxing carbon. And he told us what the numbers should be, and they come out of the model. So this, this is his graph. And what I'm showing you are, for, what, what Bill shows uh, are two uh, curves. There's a red curve at the bottom that basically shows what implied carbon prices will be, social cost of carbon, if we are very loose, if we continue to do what we have been doing. They will kind of drift upward slowly and they'll be small. What we need to do, the model says, is follow the blue trajectory. So the blue trajectory now is sort of around $35 to $40 a ton. US dollars, a bit higher in Canadian, of course. And we cross $50 uh, dollars a ton, around, according to Bill, around uh, 2035. And then it just keeps on going up. So we need to tax carbon so that the price of carbon coincides with its social cost. That's Bill's message. If we do that, if we make carbon expensive, it will, of course, force up the prices of items that are intensive in carbon. And, you know, the law of supply and demand will induce us to consume less carbon and look for alternatives that are safer and cleaner. That's the whole point of taxing carbon. So, you all know that the liberal, at the federal level, the liberal government actually imposed a carbon tax uh, uh, last fall. And it, it did it because Canada, Canada's a signatory to, to the, climate, the Paris Climate Agreement. And that agreement says that you know, by 2030, uh, the country's committed to reducing its, its uh, carbon by a specific amount, uh, 30%. And uh, it looks like if, we, if Canada was to follow the policy, it was going to get down to maybe 4%, but nowhere near reaching, reaching its, um, its uh, committed target levels. All right, so you need to do something. So if you're going to do something as opposed to just saying, yes, we're going to try our best, you need something with a bite, something that will enforce uh, the, the action. And so that's what a carbon tax will do. Um, so it starts off at 20, rises at $10 a year, reaching $50 in 2022, and $50 in 2022 is not that far from what, from what Bill's model suggests. So that's sort of a reasonable policy. Uh, it has another of other interesting features. Um, I won't go in, into the details. It's not a perfect system by any means. There are political issues because not everybody favors this particular policy. I think that in Manitoba it's not so popular as a uh, collectively speaking, but I would say it's in it's a it's the right step. It goes in the right direction. Don't abandon it. Try and fix it. What's wrong with it? Rather than looking at the imperfections and saying it's hopeless, throw the thing out. That would be my recommendation. Emissions. All right. So. If we don't do anything, we'll be at what's called the base projection. In 2013, the base, predic uh, the base prediction was the green line. Okay? And now the base prediction is the blue line. So its emissions are a, a little bit less relative to what they, uh, the prediction was from 2013. And if you look at the optimal, so the optimal is uh, red 
uh, uh, today, and uh, purple is what it was in 2013. And so what you can see is that emissions continue to rise you know, for the, at least the first half of the 21st century, no matter what trajectory you look at. But if you tax carbon, emissions are going to be lower, and that's what it's going to take to fight climate change, that you get those emissions down. They just have to go down. There's no substitute. We cannot lay in bed at night and dream, well, maybe there's another way. Well, I, I shouldn't say, you know, never, never say never. Maybe there is another way. But it's going to be high stakes, high gamble to find that other way. It may be that we have to repollute in order to do what happened through a natural experiment. The natural experiment was unintended, but we had terrible air pollution in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And that air pollution actually gave us global cooling. We had global cooling. The big fear in 1970 was not global warming. It was that we were going to have another ice age, because temperatures were declining. What we didn't understand was it was declining because of air pollution. So we might have to fight climate change, global warming, by reintroducing some form of pollution. It might actually have to be intentional. Maybe we can introduce it into the, higher, into the upper atmosphere. Well, you know, that kind of engineering is also scary. The law of unintended consequences. You have a lot to, you have a lot to think about. Whatever it is, not good. My wife says I should smile more when I talk about climate change. <laughs> So this is what's going to happen to temperatures, according to Bill's model. So if we don't do anything today, we're going to wind up with the green curve at the top. They're just going to continue to climb. Uh, if we do something today and follow an optimal tax, carbon tax policy, then we're still going to face rising temperatures, just not as much, and we'll eventually level off in the, at early on in the next century and even get a decline if we're careful enough. We can even bring temperatures back down again from the absolute top if, if we have sensible policy. But if we can't collectively find a way to get together and we stay on the green trajectory, that's what it's going to be. Economists don't always agree with each other. In fact, they mostly disagree. That's why there are all these jokes. If you laid all the economists in the world end to end, you'd never reach a conclusion. They'd never reach a conclusion. So um, two key figures in climate change, not the only ones, but these, defi these guys definitely command uh, attention and respect. So this is uh, Sir Nicholas Stern. So he was at the LSE at Bowen School of Economics when Erwin, who's in the audience, and I were there together in the 1970s as a young faculty member at the time. He's written the most uh, extensive report on climate change called the Stern Report. And he too advocates um, uh, uh, carbon taxes, but at a much higher rate than Nordhaus. Okay, so if you think Nordhaus's numbers would make us face high energy prices, high prices at the pump, Stern's numbers are, are, are much higher. So he's in the $40 to $80 range, whereas today uh, Nordhaus is around $33 for the size of the tax. And why, why do they vary? They vary because of this question. It's a philosophical difference. It's, 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 not, it's, 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 not, it's not about the underlying operational issues and the science. Morally, what is the responsibility of today's generation to invest in fighting climate change for the benefit of the future generation? And Stern says, we ought to treat future generations like they're us because they're going to be carrying our genes forward. We ought to give them the same weight we give to ourselves. And Nordhaus says, We've never done that in our history. We've always been more selfish about ourselves than about future generations. We have to be realistic. It's too much to ask us now to change human nature. So let's give numbers that are more likely to be implemented. That's the difference. In Nordhaus's model, if you look at the graph in the middle, what you will see is a picture of what sacrifice means 
if you compare what we would do if we followed the optimal trajectory relative to what we would do if we didn't. And so the green area that's circled at the bottom, which has gone slightly negative, says we will sacrifice today relative to what we would do in the future so that the future will get up above zero and enjoy a better existence than they would have otherwise because, they didn't, because we didn't sacrifice. It's about intergenerational trade-offs. That's what this debate is about between Stern and Nordhaus. And Nordhaus simply says, you know, what you see circled is about the biggest sacrifice humans are willing to make. Stern would take that green area at the right and push it down. He would make the sacrifice much bigger. Nobody's simply willing to do it. So that brings us to the politics of climate change. So there are two recent books, both, both written by authors who agree with climate scientists about the nature of climate change, agree that it's anthropogenic, and have things to say about what we might do, what we might have done in the past, why we didn't do things in the past, what we might do in the future. So uh, Nathaniel Rich, who wrote Losing Earth on the right, and David Wallace Wells, who wrote The Uninhabitable Earth on the left. And the politics is really interesting. Um, so I, I want to say two things about the politics in terms of how I've been influenced to think about politics especially political economy. So the first is, by, uh, is a book written by my, uh, my friend and former colleague, Bruce Buena de Mesquita, actually current colleague. Uh, he's at NYU, and I also teach at NYU uh, as a second position. And Bruce is, I think, the smartest political scientist that I know. He knows how to think about politics in a in an antiseptic clinical way. He applies game theory the way economists apply game theory. But he applies game theory in a way that his predictions about politics are, are much more accurate than, than economic game theorists when it comes to, to making predictions about, about specific events. And so I've learned how to think, of, think about politics from, from his perspective. And then Cy Gladick, who, 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 who taught me economics, what was in Economics 120. Here, here, here at the University of Manitoba, uh, who, 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 to, who, who taught me to think about economics from an institutional perspective, from a distribution of power perspective, from a left-wing perspective. And although I'd say politically, I sort of drifted from the left into the center. I'm pretty much of a centrist now. I'm back when I think about climate change and, and, and the politics and the economics. I come back to what I learned from Sai. I think, that, I think that the issues that he identified then are germane for, for this issue. And so Sy is the founder of Canadian Dimension, and I think that although I moved away as I got older from thinking about the world the way Canadian Dimension thinks about the world, there are, there are elements that I think Canadian Dimension has nailed. So uninhabitable Earth tells us, so these are quotes from the book itself. We have done as much damage to the fate of the planet and its ability to sustain human life and civilization, and civilization since Al Gore published his first book on the climate than in all the centuries, all the millenniums that came before. What does that message say? It says this. We have dumped more carbon dioxide and global uh, and greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, but you know when? more starting in the late 1990s, 10 years after, 10 years after we had James Hansen telling Congress, we've got a serious problem. Since 1998, there's been more dumped in. We created much more of a problem. That means we didn't do it unknowingly. We did it knowingly, collectively speaking. Before 81, there was a little bit of knowledge I'll get to, but after 88 came, it was there. We just ignored it. And we have all the tools we need today to stop it all. A carbon tax. 
the political apparatus to aggressively phase out dirty energy, a new approach to agricultural practices, a shift away from beef and dairy in the global diet. That shift is important because methane is a very potent global a greenhouse gas. And public investment in green energy and carbon capture. So we, we have the knowledge, we have the tools, and globally, we're simply not doing enough. Losing Earth tells us Exxon studied the carbon dioxide problem for decades, even before Exxon changed its name to Exxon when it was humble oil. In 1957, when I was in elementary school, okay, humble oil wrote about, quote, the enormous quantity of carbon dioxide emitted into the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution from the combustion of fossil fuels in 1957. The American Petroleum Institute in 1968, when I was still a student here, wrote a study, concluded that the burning of fossil fuels would bring significant temperature changes by the year 2000 and ultimately serious worldwide environmental changes, including the melting of the Antarctic ice cap and rising seas. 1968. The Charney Report, Jules Charney was the most important meteorologist in the world in the late 70s at MIT, and he authored a collective study of climate scientists on this issue, Carbon Dioxide and Climate, a Scientific Assessment, was the title of his report. After he published it, Exxon beefed up its research program on global warming. Why? Because they began to worry that they were going to get blamed now. So what could they do in order to mitigate their legal exposure? Well, not everybody agrees with, uh, with climate scientists, mainstream climate scientists, I should say most mainstream climate scientists. And as a behavioral economist, I'm especially interested in the question of why. Okay? So, no, so this is important. I hope my views are clear. But honestly, Every, humans disagree with each other. It's important to be respectful, to take a step back, because sometimes I can hold a strong opinion but be wrong. That has happened. It's important to understand what those who disagree with you, why they think the way they do. Sit down, listen respectfully, because they might be right. They might be right about everything, they might be right about some things, but you can learn things. So these are the Koch brothers up at the top left. Um, this is Gordon Moore at the top right. So Gordon Moore is, is a Canadian climate uh, skeptic. And uh, this is uh, James Inhofe, uh, who's a senator from Oklahoma, who's holding a snowball on the floor of the US Senate. Why? Because he represents energy interests in, in Oklahoma. The Koch brothers uh, have, uh, are, uh, their wealth is in, in fossil fuel energy. And he's arguing that climate change, global warming, is a hoax. It is not happening. There is no climate change, let alone anthropogenic generated climate change. And so in the winter in Washington, when it snows, he brought in a snowball and said, look, the global warming? And then he threw the snowball. Oh, sorry, sorry. See what happens when you get excited? <laughs> Gordon Moore says, carbon dioxide creating rising temperatures on the planet? Do you know how much carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere? Just a little bit. Can't. Impossible. So that's, you know, that's the perspective. Um, Bjorn Lomborg, very famous, very smart uh, climate skeptic is an environmentalist, he, he just doesn't think that we're going to solve climate change and says we may as well not do things that harm poor people. 
because cli fighting climate change will harm poor people. And so we may as well look for ways that use resources to help people while we can. Fred Singer, Fred Singer's uh, written more about climate change hoax in the Wall Street Journal than anybody else for decades and uh, founder of the Heartland Institute, which uh, is a think tank for fighting. It's a think tank for the free enterprise view that says government is bad. And Stephen McIntyre has spoken several times, a Canadian uh, uh, climate change skeptic at, at the Heartland Institute. So the sea is rising, but not because of climate change, was uh, a, a recent piece by Fred Singer in the Wall Street Journal. And what he says is that the cause of the trend is a puzzle. So in the old days, in the 90s and the early 2000s, the, the argument went, there is no climate change. Climate scientists are only telling us this so they can hold conferences and feather their own nests. That was the nature of the argument. What I want you to see in, in this, the sea is rising, but not because of climate change, is that there's a psychological bias called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias, you play up information that supports your view. You play down information that goes against your view. If you will not even acknowledge the possibility that you're wrong about climate change, you're suffering from severe confirmation bias. We all have to acknowledge the possibility that our, that our positions are wrong and look at the evidence as opposed to not refusing to look at the evidence that we might have it incorrect. So these are two guys, Scott Armstrong and Keston Green. They're academics I respect, but they're, and, they're, and they're climate skeptics. And the interesting question for me is, why is it that we're all looking at this information the same information, and coming to such different positions. So um, their work looks at the IPCC reports, and they're forecasters. And they understand what it takes to be good at forecasting. And what it takes to be good at forecasting is to follow a set of specific principles. And if you look at the IPCC forecasters, the climate scientists, they violate a lot of the most important forecasting principles. So methodologically, there are issues, legitimate issues, to look at. It doesn't mean that the forecasts won't be wrong. It just means you really can't have as much confidence in, the, in, in what forecasters have to say, if you, generally, if, the, if, the, if you're in violation of those principles. So this is a behavioral issue. Even it's a question of whether you can believe the IPCC forecasts when the underlying methodology is weak. That's the question. So remember what I said at the beginning. Don't think about heroes. Don't think if you agree with a person's position that they must be right and be doing everything right. We're all making mistakes, all of us, no matter what side of the issue we are, whether it's Hansen or whether, whether, whether it's the IPCC. The behavioral issues, they're huge. They are just huge when it comes to climate change. We have a mix of preferences. Some people want to sacrifice now for future generations. Others don't. We have a mix of beliefs. Some people believe that climate change is happening and it's anthropogenic. Some people don't believe it's happening. Some people believe it's happening, but they think it's part of natural cycles. We have overconfidence, even among the leading climate scientists uh, in the world, in terms of James Hansen's 99% forecast. 99% is simply too confident, being too confident. We have extreme confirmation bias. And Fred Singer, who won't even acknowledge the possibility he's wrong. So when we use the term motivated reasoning in, uh, in psychology, we mean we're motivated to only cherry pick information before us that supports our views. We sweep everything else under the carpet. And we also have hindsight bias. So in Losing Earth, when you look at the story that, that Nathaniel Rich tells, 
it's very easy to go back and look at what we didn't do in the 1980s and say, how could we have been so stupid? But honestly, Hansen was telling us, but not all the evidence was there at the time. The IPC was very careful in the late 80s and early 90s not to overstep in the sense of making a forecast that was too bold relative to what they knew for sure at the time. They had to wait for the evidence to come in. But in the end, what we have today is the biggest self-control problem the human race has ever faced. Because to solve climate change, we're going to have to exhibit great sacrifice today. And that's hard to do. Carbon taxes, we're not going to I don't think we're going to get global garb, a global carbon price, even though we need it so badly. We're not going to get it because it may be good for nature, but Nordhaus says he realizes it's not all that attractive to voters because it means we're going to have to incur lower incomes. That's, you can see it in France with the yellow vest demonstrations, which are powerful and strong. And what's the complaint? Higher gas prices is the first complaint. Well, that's what you have to do to reduce fossil fuel consumption. But it hurts. And if you're already struggling, you don't want to hear about future generations' benefit. You're, you're the one who's suffering today. That means we need to think about psychological, political ways of dealing with climate change. Because what the economic solution prescribes, even though it's a first best solution, it doesn't satisfy the political constraint. We need to focus our attention on other ways. And that means focused issues on health and jobs. Things that resonate with people. Then they will vote for things that will give us, will fight climate change. As opposed to sacrifice. You ask people to sacrifice, forget it. That's the message. How we frame the prescriptions, what we ask people to vote on, is going to be critical. And that's where we're finally shifting our attention. That's where we're going to get nudges. So it's, whether it's about clean energy or people's health, there's a much better chance of moving forward if we can get the focus on the things that people care about now. Nordhaus temperature forecast. So this is what I showed you before, except I want to show you the key points, the vertical bars. This is when we're going to get up above 2 degrees Celsius. That's about 2040, if we don't do anything. We're going to get up above 3, around just after 2060. We're going to get up above 4 by 2090. And we're going to get up above 5 in 2020. That's the projection if we don't do anything, if we don't put in practice something that gives us close to what would happen with the carbon tax solution. So Nathaniel Rich tells us in his book, if we get to two degrees, this is what's going to happen. Extinction of the world's tropical reefs. There won't be a Great Barrier Reef anymore. Sea level rise of several meters. And the whole Persian Gulf is going to get abandoned. Okay. If we get to three degrees, there are going to be forests in the Arctic. And most of the coastal cities on the planet will disappear. San Francisco will be gone. New York will be gone. If we get to four degrees, Europe is going to be in permanent drought. The Colorado River is going to be a trickle. There will not be much of a population in the American Southwest. And if we get to five degrees, human civilization will be toast. You just need to go back to Nordhaus's graph and see when those things will happen. And you know what Nordhaus has told us? He's told us, he's gone back to his predictions from the 1990s, and he's gone back to the climate sciences prediction from the 1990s. He's been off. Most of what the climate scientists said in the 1990s, they haven't been off. If anything, they were conservative in their forecasts. So here are the things that, that I sort of write about in Forbes when I write about climate change. First thing I did was right after the Paris Agreement, I saw no carbon taxes in the Paris Agreement, none. And I said, if there's no teeth to that agreement, 
Everything else are platitudes. We'll never get there. The Paris Agreement is just like a New Year's resolution. You feel good about it when you say, this is what I'm going to do. But by the time February arrives, forget it. You're back to your old habits. Well, guess what? That's where we are. We're not living up to the Paris Agreements. Christ uh, Christiana Figueres, who headed up the, uh, did all the groundwork and was a major leader. So she said, I would rather, why, why no carbon prices? She said, I would rather move now on what we can do than wait for economists' perfection. That's why there's nothing about, about carbon prices in there. Um, I also write about American policy towards climate change because our current, our meaning the US, current president uh, thinks that uh, climate scientists uh, are, um, have little credibility. He sides with the Koch brothers. Pretty much he said he thinks climate, climate change is a hoax. And I think that um, there are psychological issues associated with that perspective. <laughs> so, in summary, climate change is complex. It's, it's not simple. The theory is reasonably straightforward, as physical theories go, but, but the whole issue is, is complex. Forecasting is not difficult. It's not impossible, but it, we're, we can be off. Hansen was off in his initial projections, for example. Um, the behavioral issues, they are large. Okay? They are what's standing in the way of having all the tools and the knowledge to do the job and not getting ourselves to be able collectively to do the job. Politics and science clash. Politics and economics clash. So in the end, businesses, they're going to be front and center for dealing with climate change. Maybe fighting climate change, but definitely dealing with it because we're not going to be able to escape it. And so the best thing is, you know, use imagination to prepare for what I think will be a difficult, uncertain future. So with that happy note, I'll conclude. And uh, if there's time for questions, I'll take one or two questions. I have two, uh, a lot of questions, but I do uh, agree with the, the concern about increasing carbon dioxide emissions. But there's all kinds of debates, yeah. and the question you've raised is people aren't confident that the scientists are right on yeah. Um So the first, uh, first question is about carbon tax. Yeah. I have a question about carbon tax. Yeah. To me, it seems it's a, it's a, a tax on the poor. Yes. And if you look at uh, sin taxes on alcohol, gasoline, and so on, right. they weren't as a strong incentive to change as com competition. So you take the electric car, right. somebody wanted to make money, yeah. uh, he started making the Tesla, right. not all the other car makers are competing. So the business uh, seemed to be more successful at making a change to use of uh, uh, carbon uh, gas right. than the tax. Right. And same with cigarettes and so on. Uh, so, what other alternative besides carbon tax, which I believe uh, penalize uh, the poor more than they do the wealthy? So, second question is science. Yes, yes CO two is going up, but there are ways. Uh, there's a recent article in the paper or in the news about in Australia where they're uh, converting the CO two back to the earth. Right. Is there enough? Uh, uh, technology to do that right. to mitigate the emissions. You, re reducing emissions is needed. Yeah. But can you also increase that by converting the carbon to uh, the earth? Right. Those, those, those are all great questions uh, and important questions. So um, I'll, I'll give I'll give you my my sense of of, of all of them. Um, I, I think that. Most of the uncertainty that people feel about, about whether climate scientists are right is largely the result of a campaign of confusion that's, that's akin to what happened with the smoking industry when it was clear that 
smoking nicotine consumption has a direct impact on human health. And they did, and the smoking and the tobacco industry did everything they can. They could muddy the waters and confuse people about whether it was controversial. I think that the climate science is really clear. I think that Hansen's models and the nature of his predictions have provided, so, you know, the only thing that's really certain in this world are death and taxes, okay? So the same thing is true about climate science, but the degree of confidence we can now have that those models are right is so strong because the predictions from 35 years ago are playing out exactly the way he said. We cannot ignore that. If we, so I think that it's, the issues are more political. Yes, carbon tax is a tax on the poor, there's no question. I think that's what makes it politically infeasible. So we're gonna just simply have to live with it because I don't think that people are gonna vote for that kind of sacrifice. Um, uh, and and, I, and, and one, you know, one, can, one can understand it. The unfortunate thing is there is no clear substitute for carbon taxes to get the impact. That's really what the problem is. So we're, go, we're, going, to, we're going to get something that's, more, that's closer to the green scenario, which is the high problematic scenario, than, than the other scenario. What about carbon capture, the Australian issue? So the answer is there, there, there are, and I, I also believe in the private sector. We, the private sector will be, provide solutions. Um, like, you know, for example, I think your point about Tesla is, is, is well taken. Won't be enough. That's, that's really the problem, won't be enough. You won't be able to capture enough carbon by regenerating the forests of the world at a rate that's rapid enough relative to the rate at which we're emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So, you know, alas, you know, it's, it, it, it's mixed. It, it doesn't have to be, it, it, it could be a little bit better than, than the bleak forecast, but it won't be the outcome that's more ideal, which is what would happen if we could find a way collectively to, 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 to get what the carbon tax solution would, would give us. Uh, we have Christina, yes, okay, Christina. One more question? Yes. Um, why is this room not packed? Why is this not front page of the window? And, and just a quick comment about framing carbon tax. Yeah. I think the big problem is that word is not being sold right. If there was transparency, and if our governments would tell us, this is what we're going to do with your taxes. Yes. We're going to give, uh, we're going to give you money <coughs> so you can buy these efficient cars, these, you know, and, and we're going to invest in this and that. That's going to help us to lower our emissions. Uh, I think that is, it, it just makes me furious. <laughs> um, that we're, you know, we're here and where everybody should be paying attention. And especially the evidence you give, how long we have known this, and the inactivity of our governments to do something meaningful. Yes, those, those are all very, very good points. The, so marketing is as much about psychology than anything else. You also need to market policy prescriptions, especially if they, if, if they have features that lead us to be uncomfortable. If you don't emphasize what the benefits are in the way that you described, well, then you're not going to be as effective in convincing people. So it is about per being, being persuasive. Follow up on that. The point of problem is the politi politicians are not being trusted. Yes. And they're, they're the ones promoting it. So it's the wrong group promoting it, which is part of your point. Why is it the free press or the public promoting it yes. versus the politicians? Because they're going to just waste the money. That's not just true in Winnipeg. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to add one little thing about, you had mentioned about some, we're not always right. And I just wanted to challenge you on one thing about agriculture yeah. and about the methane from animals. Yeah. And, and I do not agree with that. Okay. We do need animals in our nutrient recycling. In agriculture, what we need to do is we need to farm smaller yes. and, and actually pay attention to our, our nutrient cycling and have the animal manure in, in that mix. Right, I am, yes. And, yes. So that's, that's a whole other discussion, and I, I'd love to talk with you after. I'll see. Okay. Thanks.
Thank you very much uh, for an enlightening talk and to accommodate uh, her. She's really busy scheduled for, for today. We'll conclude this. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much.